I'm Jean Howard from the Columbia University Department of English and Comparative Literature and a very um, happy and grateful member of the Archives Project uh, that, that helped to organize this conference. Our several years of work together have been an extraordinary collaborative experience, some of the excitement of which I found captured in the remarkable range of voices, discourses, and images through which yesterday's participants addressed issues of urban catastrophe and urban injury. When we imagined this conference, one aspiration was to expand our collective capacity for responding to the challenges that injured cities represent, whether they are injured by enemy states, civil war, urban planners, or the slow rot of poverty and deindustrialization. We hoped that by bringing together people who would not in the ordinary course of things, talk together, we would each be able to discover new ways of understanding the causes of injury and new ways to cope, resist, respond, and remake. Last evening, I was moved by the extraordinary inventiveness and ethical integrity with which the Colombian performance group Mapa Teatro engaged over a period of 10 years with a prolonged process of slum clearance in the heart of Bogota. But I was equally moved in the morning session by Ariela Uzali's trenchant analysis of regime-made disasters, of the deliberate destruction of communal infrastructures and the forced dislocation of urban populations, and moved by her suggestion that those who are harmed by such regime-made disasters are not only those who are its targeted victims, but also those who are citizens of the dominant regime, those who are made complicit by their state's actions. She urged that one thing we must demand, therefore, is the right not to be made perpetrators. For those of us who have been made complicit in the US global and domestic responses to the injury that was 9-11, her comments struck a deep chord. There were many other remarkable parts of yesterday's events but rather than trying to enumerate them all, we should turn now to today's panels, which I anticipate with no less excitement. Before I give the morning's program over to our moderator, however, I do want again to express our sadness that Anne McClintock, who was to be one of our speakers this morning, is not able to be with us because of an injury that her partner sustained last week. We miss her voice at this conference very much and wish a speedy recovery for her partner. We are deeply grateful to Diana Taylor from NYU, who will be giving a paper in her stead. And now let me turn the program over to Hazel Carby, Professor of African American and American Studies at Yale University, and also a wonderful member of our Archives Project. Thank you, Jean, and um, good morning and welcome uh, to the second day of this amazing conference. Um, I wanted to start by thanking the, um, the organizers, um, all of them, but also particularly Marianne and uh, Kate for all their sort of wonderful support and caring. Uh, I also was going to say that I deeply regret the fact that Anne McClintock can't be with us this morning. Her partner had surgery and she needed to uh, stay with him. But I'm also deeply grateful to Diana for uh, coming aboard. So what we have uh, planned for you this morning are three presentations. They'll be 20 to 25 minutes each, leaving us plenty of time for uh, conversation afterwards. I will introduce the speakers all together uh, now, and uh, they will speak in this order. So first, we will hear from uh, Nina Bernstein. And as you know, there are bios in the program. So these are extremely brief introductions. Um, but Nina is a reporter for the New York Times who's written on a broad range of social and legal issues since she joined the paper in 1995. She's covered immigration since 2004, and her investigative reporting on deaths in immigration detention received several awards last year. Nina's presentation is entitled <coughs> Exiled in America. Second, Anne Jones will speak, 
Anne Jones is an authority on violence against women. She's a journalist, a photographer, an activist, and an author of eight books of non-fiction, most recently, War Is Not Over When It's Over, which is an account of a year's work with women and cameras in war-torn countries from West Africa to Iraq, assessing the impact of continuing violence on women. And Anne's presentation this morning is entitled, Kabul Ruined Again. Diana Taylor is University Professor and Professor of Performance Studies and Spanish at NYU. She's the author most recently of the archive and the repertoire, Performing Cultural Memory in the Americas. She is also the founding director of the Hemispheric Institute of Performance and Politics. And so the final presentation for our panel this morning is entitled Performing Citizenship, Activist Take to the Streets. So first of all, if you'll welcome Nina Bernstein. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming this morning. Uh, on 9-11 and in its aftermath, uh, I was, as I am now, a reporter for the New York Times for the Metro Desk. And in that uh, first period, we really lived at a new pitch. I especially remember um, the day of the Times anthrax scare. It was uh, October 12th, almost exactly a decade ago. The police cordons around our building, the moment in the lobby when we realized the cops were there to keep us in, and uh, the climbing up the stairs back to the newsroom, seeing behind us plodding up city and ins health inspectors in moon suits. Um, and finally, that evening, the release to see the musical Kiss Me Kate with my sister and a theater packed full of New Yorkers glad to be alive. It was only in preparing this talk that I juxtaposed that intense personal timeline with the post 9-11 experience of two young men living in New York at the same time, Yasser Ibrahim and his brother Hani. Before 9-11, Yasser, the older brother, had a web design business in Brooklyn. Hani had worked his way up from stock boy to grill man and then manager of a deli in Brooklyn's Ocean Parkway. When they weren't working, they hung out in the village, visited electronic stores near Times Square, and took friends on rides at Coney Island. In other words, after three or four years in the city, these Egyptians were New Yorkers. Right after the World Trade Center attacks, their parents in Alexandria urged them to come home. We assured them, Yasser recalled later, this is the United States. They don't arrest people for no charges. We didn't do anything, so nothing's going to happen to us. But at 2 p.m. on September 30th, a dozen terrorism investigators from the FBI, the police, and immigration knocked at the door of the Ocean Parkway apartment that the brothers shared with several Egyptian and Moroccan friends. They took away Yasser, Hani, and another man, all with expired tourist visas. Why the investigators showed up is unclear. As the Inspector General of the Justice Department's uh, report pointed out later, some interrogations were prompted by no more than a not, hmm. <laughs> is that, was that a cue of some sort? Um, um, prompted by no more than anonymous tips about suspicious-looking foreign men. As a practical matter, once labeled of interest to investigators, they were destined for the maximum security unit of the Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn, among hundreds of similar men swept up and delivered to MDC in shackles in the weeks after 9-11. What happened there, what happened there has been detailed in legal briefs in the Inspector General's report, even captured on videotape. But Yasser's descriptions made it personal. Physical abuse began the moment they arrived. He saw guards slam his brother into a wall where an American flag t-shirt had been taped. Then they did the same to him. 
One of the guards who strip searched him asked, what's your crime? When he said, nothing, I just overstayed my visa, the guard retorted, oh, I don't think so. If you're here, it means that someone somewhere thinks you're connected to September 11th. Pain became part of the daily routine. Escort teams cursing them as Muslims and terrorists slammed them into every available wall when they were taken from their cells, twisted their wrists and fingers, and stepped on their leg chains so that they fell, their an ankles bruised and bloody. Solitary confinement under fluorescent lights on constantly, body cavity searches for no apparent reason. That was the underlying regime. And for Yasser, it upended a deeply idealized view of the United States. Worse than physical or verbal abuse, he told me later, was, quote, the feeling that we are being hidden from the outside world, and nobody knows in the outside world that we are arrested and in this place. Hani recalled that guards and lieutenants terrified him by saying, you're going to stay here the rest of your life. When Yasser finally saw an immigration judge at a closed hearing, he tried to tell him about the abuse. But the transcript shows the judge cut him off. The brothers agreed to immediate deportation. By December 7th, FBI memos stated that clearance checks of the brothers had shown no links to terrorism. Yet they were held for six more months. Hani until May 29th, 2002, mostly in the general population. Yasser in, until June 6th, mostly in solitary confinement. Many Americans assume that the governmental power to incarcerate such people was created by the Patriot Act. Actually, it has a much older history. Though immigration detainees are typically locked up in jails and prisons in this country, often side by side with people charged or convicted of violent crimes, legally, their incarceration is not considered a deprivation of liberty, let alone a punishment based on a line of United States Supreme Court decisions rooted in the 19th century Chinese exclusion laws, immigration detention is considered an administrative civil measure taken solely for the purpose of deportation. So the familiar rules of due process don't apply. People facing deportation have no assurance of a lawyer. In effect, they can be held for years without recourse, a practice modified, though not eliminated, by a Supreme Court ruling, Sadvidas v. Davis, that held indefinite detention is constitutional only if the detainee is dangerous and defined the limit generally as more than six months. For both legal and illegal immigrants, however, harsher policies were embraced in 1996, sharply curtailing defenses against deportation, severely narrowing judicial review that would allow consideration of individual circumstances, and raising civil and criminal penalties for immigration law violations. The measures also retroactively mandated the detention of all non-citizens who ever committed a crime on a list of deportable offensive offenses expanded to include misdemeanors like shoplifting. Still, it was only after 9-11 that the 1996 measures were vigorously enforced. The Bush administration explicitly resorted to immigration law as a weapon in its war on terror. The government, the inspector general said later, made little or no effort to distinguish between genuine suspects and Muslim immigrants with minor visa violations like the Ibrahim brothers. Virtually all who were rounded up in this way eventually were cleared, like them, of any link to terrorism and deported. When the brothers finally reached home in Alexandria, they found that the presumption of guilt had followed them into an Egyptian Secret Service dossier that made them unemployable. Hani had a nervous breakdown. He and Yasser, who married and had a son, eked out a, small, eked out a living in a small family jewelry business. Yet they had what it took to seek redress. As plaintiffs in a class action lawsuit brought by the Center for Constitutional Rights here in New York, against John Ashcroft, the Attorney General, Robert Mueller, the head of the FBI, and other top federal officials. The suit, Turkman v. Ashcroft, filed in 2002, charged that the plaintiffs had been abused and deprived of their constitutional rights because of their religion or national origin. 
In court papers, the defendants denied wrongdoing and argued in part that the September 11th attacks created special factors, including the need to detect and deter future terror attacks that outweighed the plaintiff's rights to sue for damages of, for any constitutional violations. I reported on others held in this sort of legal no man's land between immigration enforcement and counterterrorism in 2004 and 2005. But I didn't catch up with the Ibrahim brothers until January 2006. Then, against all odds, they and four other plaintiffs in the Turkmen suit were returning to New York, no longer the accused, but the accusers. A federal judge in Brooklyn had denied the government's motion to summarily dismiss their lawsuit against top officials. The brothers were being allowed back for a week of depositions. But the conditions imposed by the US government included the requirement that they be in the constant custody of federal marshals, that they couldn't call anyone from the undisclosed hotel where they were they are kept for depositions. Their parents begged them not to go. The brothers were fearful, but they were determined. Putting themselves in the hands of the government they were suing was an act of faith in America, they told me, in phone interviews before the trip. Part of my motivation is to make sure that what happened to us doesn't happen to more people in the future, Yasser said. I'm seeking justice. It's from the same system that did us injustice before, but I have faith in the system. I know what happened before was a mistake. It was a feel-good story. To me, a confirmation of the enduring power of New York City in an alternate mythology of America, as the historian Thomas Bender constructed it in a, an article in Dissent in 1987. Not a city upon a hill, but a center of difference and conflict that offers an alternative to America's Puritan and Jeffersonian myths a Whitman-esque city that not only tolerated diversity, but depended on it. I learned later that this feel-good moment was too facile. A piece of the narrative was missing. In 2003, about eight months after Yasser's de deportation, Irom Sheikh, an oral historian, had interviewed him at length in an Alexandria coffee shop for a chapter in her book, Detained Without Cause, Muslim Stories of Detention and Deportation in America After 9-11. Published this year, that book provides new insight into the political and emotional arc of Yasser's aftermath. Before 9-11, I always considered the US a model of how humans can lead free lives in a democratic society, he told her. In any other country, things are unstable and can change in a minute. I believed the American people built this freedom and that they would fight to hold on to it for a very long time. Now I see that the, what they used to tell us about human rights, democracy, and freedom is all crap. They were only waiting for an excuse to change the democracy to an autocracy, like any other dictatorship in a third world country. A part of me is broken, he said. I was hoping to see Egypt have a democracy one day like the United States. Now I don't. I know now that it does not exist. Everything I used to believe turned out to be a lie. These days, he told her in 2003, he only thought about business. He had stopped reading literature. Open-ended ideas which require thinking, I don't want to deal with them. Now I am over fiction. I want to adapt to reality. Yet already, his case was changing reality in complicated and still contested ways. In January 2006, Rachel Mirapol, the plaintiff's lawyer, underscored the wider meaning of the Turkmen case. The post 9-11 domestic immigration sweeps were the first example of the Bush administration's willingness to ignore the law and hold people outside the judicial system, she, she told me. The kind of torture, interrogation, and arbitrary detention that we now associate with Guantanamo and secret CIA facilities really started here in Brooklyn. Then in June 2006, a federal judge in Brooklyn dismissed several of the lawsuit's key claims, ruling that the government had wide latitude under immigration law to detain non-citizens on the basis of religion, race, or national origin, and to hold them indefinitely without explanation. 
But the judge, John Gleason, allowed the lawsuit to continue on other claims, including the argument that the conditions of confinement were abusive and unconstitutional. Both sides appealed. Ms. Mirapal said parts of Judge Gleason's ruling could potentially be used far more broadly to detain any non-citizen of the U.S. for any reason. This decision is a green light to racial profiling and prolonged detention of non-citizens at the whim of the president, she said. Judge Gleason rejected the government's argument that the events of 9-11 justified extraordinary measures to confine non-citizens who fell under suspicion or that the attacks heightened top officials' need for governmental immunity. But his interpretation of immigration law gave the government this broad discretion to enforce the law selectively against non-citizens of a particular religion, race, or national origin, and to detain them indefinitely for any unspecified reason after an immigration judge had ordered them removed from the country. He wrote, the executive is free to single out nationals of a particular country and focus enforcement efforts on them. This is, of course, an extraordinarily rough and overbroad sort of distinction, which, if applied to citizens, our courts, of which, if applied to citizens, our courts would be highly suspicious. Yet, he continued, the Supreme Court has repeatedly held that Congress and the executive branch, in exercising their broad power over naturalization and immigration, can make rules that would be unacceptable if applied to American citizens. David Cole, a law professor at Georgetown and co-counsel in the lawsuit, said the ruling made New York City, I'm sorry, New York, an equal protection free zone. What this decision says is the next time there's a terror attack, the government is free to round up every Muslim immigrant in the US based solely on their ethnic and religious identity and hold them on immigration pretexts for as long as it desires, he said. We saw after 9-11 what the government did in an era of uncertainty about how far it can go. Judge Gleason has essentially given them a green light to go much further. From Alexandria, Yasser said that he was shocked and very disappointed by the judge's decision. I can't believe the court would allow this to happen, he said. I'm frightened for other Muslims in the US. A lawsuit involving similar claims reached the United States Supreme Court which ruled five to four that a Pakistani Muslim who was arrested after 9-11 could not sue top officials because he had failed at a preliminary stage to allege a plausible link between the officials and abuses in the Brooklyn jail. Legal advocates said that decision would make it very hard in the future for anyone to hold high government officials accountable for discriminatory practices. But it did not affect the federal tort claims of abuse by the Turkmen plaintiffs. Indeed, in November 2009, after seven years of motions, cross appeals, and delays, the federal government paid $1.2 million to settle the cases of the Ibrahim brothers and three other plaintiffs. The government admitted no fault, but Ms. Mirapal said the amount the it was willing to pay spoke volumes. The larger lawsuit went on, moreover, added five plaintiffs, and continued to press the argument that the roundups and physical abuse were unconstitutional. Yasser's payment was $356,000, of which he received $270,000 after legal expenses. He bought a car, a Toyota Corolla. He and Hani helped their younger brothers enter the family business. And he began thinking again about democracy. Two years ago, he joined what he called the symbolic demonstrations, just silent standings by the sea. These were the beginnings of the movement in Egypt that grew one million strong through Facebook and Twitter. When Khalid Saeed, a young businessman, was publicly beaten to death by Egyptian police in June of last year, Yasser and Hani threw themselves into the protests. People said, you have too much to lose. You have your business. You have your family. You have your son. Be more careful. But I got to the point when I didn't care, he said. All four of us brothers were involved in the revolution. Hani and myself. <coughs> We experienced prison and detention, so we should be the first two of the four brothers to be scared, but we were encouraging our brothers to fight back. It was really high risk. It was either we liberate our country or we all go to jail. It would have been a very ugly ending, and one of us could have been shot like the 800 Mubarak killed. We have great respect for those who died on the street for the liberation of Egypt. 
Yasser told me all this in a long telephone interview this August. He is almost 40 now. His son is eight. He has a daughter just under a year old. I reminded him of what he had said in the book eight years ago, repudiating all his ideals. Before September 11th, he said, I used to believe in the democracy of the US and the free world and all those things. In 2003, I denounced everything and my view changed to the other extreme. But I think maybe as I grew up or through the progress in the case, I started to calm down. I came to the conclusion that everywhere there is good and evil. There are people who abuse democracy and freedom and people who respect that and who are ready to fight for that, like people in the Center for Constitutional Rights and people such as yourself. Democracy is there, freedom is there, but it just needs somebody to take care and to guard it. I really hope, he said, that America can go back to the way it was before September 11th. I don't think it's possible. But now, if everything goes right, Egypt will be more like what America was. To re revisit this case in the context of this conference is to suddenly see refractions between injured cities across time and generations that only literature, perhaps, can turn into constellations. Yes, Rachel Mirapol, who leads the appeal, is the granddaughter of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. The children of Japanese Americans interned after Pearl Harbor filed an amicus brief on Yasser Abrahim's side. Alexandria and New York are still in dialogue. So I'll conclude with my favorite lines from Tom Stoppard's play, Arcadia, from the scene set in 1809, when a brilliant adolescent girl weeps for Alexandria's lost library, set aflame centuries before by the conquering armies of Mark Antony. Her tutor comforts her with the reminder of the works that have survived. And he tells her, we shed as we pick up, like travelers who must carry everything in their arms, and what we let fall will be picked up by those behind. The procession is very long, and life is very short. We die on the march, but there is nothing outside the march, so nothing can be lost to it. Thank you. I'm so moved by what we've just heard, as I'm sure you are as well. Uh, I'm going to talk about Kabul um, as an injured city and um, try to give you a little sense of it and um, Uh, and then afterwards, I will um, show some um, some photographs, time permitting. Um, before I talk about Kabul, I, I want to just quickly touch a few points because I've been reflecting upon my Afghanistan experience and and uh, what I wanted to talk to you about today in the light of things that we talked about at the conference yesterday. Um, there were such moving presentations about the effect of 9-11 on people living in New York. Um, and so I want to remind you that the experience of people living in Kabul is exceedingly different. 9-11 um, was one cataclysmic event. Um, people in Kabul have been living in a state of war with very, very brief intermissions since 1979. And um, the war, of course, is still ongoing. At the time I went there in 2002, just after we had bombed it, um, two-thirds to three-quarters of the city was in ruins, in complete ruins. The Americans didn't do all of that. Um, our, our favorite Afghan, 
that we supported during the um, Soviet proxy war. Uh, Gulbuddin Hekmachar Hek had done most of it, but we finished the job. And um, we heard yesterday, again, everyone thinking of the 3,000 killed when the towers fell. Uh, 4,000 were killed in Kabul with the first American bombings there. Um, then secondly, um, we, we tend to speak of New York as a city with a great enduring character, whereas Kabul is a city that is constantly in flux and has been for uh, at least the last more than 30 years. Constant uh, uh, IDPs, internally displaced people coming and going through the city, refugees fleeing, um, people who previously fled returning to try to help, uh, and people from the countryside coming in to try to avoid the military activity that's going on there. So the city has grown many times in size during the last 10 years. I don't know if anybody knows how many millions are living there now. Um, and also, because of the series of wars and regime changes in these past years, um, Kabulis are vastly different from one another depending upon the time of their growing up. So that the older citizens who grew up under the time of the king have a completely different understanding of what it means to be an Afghan or to live in Kabul from those who grew up under the Taliban and those who are growing up now. And most of the population of Afghanistan is young. Most of those young citizens, of course, have known nothing but war. So this raises real questions about what is Kabul, uh, what was Kabul, and whose memory are we to talk about when we talk about remembering Kabul as it was and when was was. Um, so uh, it's very, it can become very complicated. And then finally, of course, the key significant difference is that Kabul is a city occupied by foreigners who control it and who are completely at odds with the culture of Afghans and who have brought in along with what they call aid and so on, an enormous number of brothels, many women trafficked in from um, the former Soviet uh, countries and from China to serve in the brothels, uh, widespread alcohol consumption and mixing of men and women consuming alcohol, all this kind of thing. So um, let me say that um, after 9-11 and after the October bombing of Kabul, I, I left New York and went to Afghanistan to work with women in the ruins of that country. I spent the next several winters there and I still go back every year to help out the women's organizations I've worked with over the years and to do some reporting for the nation. So um, I'm going to speak to you today uh, and take a shortcut and read to you a little bit from a book I wrote about Afghanistan in 2006 called Kabul in Winter to try to give you a little sense of the stages of the ruination of Kabul. Um, so let me um, begin with a... With a um, trying to create, recreate for you a little bit of what Kabul once was. Uh, I'm sitting in the garden of one of the wonderful old uh, homes of the uh, upper classes that, with a European friend who now occupies one of those homes and runs an NGO out of it. We're sitting together in the garden of his home in Kabul on a morning on, in late winter when the sun is so piercing that, um, I'm sorry, I can't see my text. Is it possible to have more light? <laughs> Perhaps not. A frequent, a frequent problem in Kabul, but I hadn't expected it here. <laughs> um, 
We're sitting together in the garden of his home, thank you, in Kabul on a morning in late winter when the sun is so piercing that we've had to move into the shade of an ancient evergreen. Around us lie rows of sunken flower beds and hedges stretching away to the walls that protect the garden from the busy street beyond. At the top of the garden sprawls the old house, long and low, warmed by many windows and skirted by terraces that spill gently toward the trees. This was cobbled before the wars, a serene and gracious life sequestered behind walls, maintained by another class of cooks and cleaners, gardeners and guards, and men who shoveled human shit and hauled it away. There is something surpassingly comfortable in sitting here now in the sun, nibbling almonds and mulberries, sipping bitter tea, and listening to my friend talk of the old days before the wars in this country he knows so well. But it is unreal, this coddled moment of seeming safety here in the geometric garden where nothing now blooms. The people who once lived here amid such gardens, the better families, the intelligentsia were persecuted in one regime or another, and those who survived fled long ago to Europe or North America, leaving behind those who had labored to sustain the class that couldn't sustain the country. Most of them will never come back. Afghanistan was never a real country, says my friend. Like Pakistan, it was always a political fiction, always the invention of other countries, real ones, that had some use for the space it occupies on the maps they drew. He lapses into silence as an American combat helicopter roars overhead. And I think of Afghans far away who might even now be recalling this garden, this city, this country as real. Uh, after, uh, after that, of course, came the bombing. And let me give you some sense of that. As I mentioned, the uh, Afghans had done a pretty good job of destroying the city during the Civil War, even though they had a long tradition of never fighting in cities. You always went out into the mountains to fight. You never stayed in a city or village to, uh, to engage in combat. But all that changed. After the bombing, newly prosperous entrepreneurs, truckers, traders, smugglers, opium dealers, traffickers, and other suddenly flush locals and returned expatriates began to build again amid the ruins of Kabul, so that by 2003, the great expanse of wreckage was randomly punctuated by tall new houses adorned with curves, columns, and spiraling staircases, and finished in garish tiles of purple, green, and orange, like exotic castles in some tropical theme park. The style is known locally as Pakistani Palace, though it's said to have originated in the Gulf states among drug dealers with a need to launder profits and a taste for domestic pretension. In Kabul, the palaces draw attention to themselves, shouting of money and overshadow the mud-colored rubble so familiar to Kabulis by now as to be scarcely noticeable. You can drive through the wreckage as foreign journalists used to do so often before Iraq eclipsed Afghanistan in the news and hardly register that your mind is growing numb. They're still there, the blasted buildings that appeared in newspaper photos and on TV as graphic backdrop for flak jacketed reporters who couldn't find words to describe what they saw in that ruined city that seemed to them as lonely as the moon. As ruins go, most of those in Kabul aren't particularly dramatic, not like the snarl of twisted steel and concrete slabs that once was New York's World Trade Center. Kabul wasn't built of steel and concrete, but mostly of mud bricks. So the city's ruins are bare bone skeletons, like the building that housed the Department of Traffic. Floors and roof collapsed inward and stacked like pancakes aslant thin bricks 
a thin brick pillars that lean into air. Or fragmentary facades of business establishments block after block of storefronts that open into nothing. At what was the finest cinema, the circular iron staircase still winds upward, visible through shell-shattered walls. At the monumental mausoleum of King Nader Shah, high on a hill overlooking the city, the sun shines through holes in the dome that still balances atop shell-pocked columns. The broken marble sarcophagi of the king's family lie tumbled in the grass below. You notice these details, but then they begin to blur as the wreckage goes on, block after block after block. The rubble of tumbled neighborhoods still has not been cleared away, except in patches as someone finds money and a reason to do it. You drive the city streets, perhaps sightseeing as a morbid post-conflict tourist, or just trying to get to a meeting, and you see the smash-up stretching on forever, whole districts leveled as if struck by some great quake that cracked the Richter scale. So um, that's the destruction from the war. And today, of course, that a lot of that destruction still exists, but also the um, Pakistani palaces have uh, proliferated, particularly in a section of the city called Sherpur, which adjoins um, the, the Sharinao district of the city, um, where the beautiful old homes used to be. Sherpur was occupied by that class of working people who were the servants of the, the residents of Sharinao, and it was completely destroyed in the American bombing. There was no two stones standing on top of each other which encouraged President Karzai to immediately confiscate the land and give it out in parcels, since it was such prime real estate, to all his cabinet ministers and the justices of the Supreme Court. And when this was contested, the Supreme Court met and decided that these were entirely legal deeds. And now the greatest of the Pakistani palaces uh, cover all of that land owned by the, the ministers and the judges who rent them out, mostly to American contractors and um, TV networks at prices like, uh, I haven't heard actually the rental costs recently, but a couple of years ago they were going for twenty-five to $30,000 a month. Um, then comes the next phase, uh, which is called, um, development. This comes in to save the ruined city. And part, here's just a little part of what happens when that occurs. The foreigners with the biggest budgets pay unheard of rents for the privilege of occupying the finest houses in Kabul, with the result that more and more landlords evict their Afghan tenants in favor of deep-pocketed outsiders. The ousted tenants tumble to the next level of housing, and so on down the line until those tenants at the bottom of the rent market are forced out to squat in the ruins or join the city's roving homeless. Sooner or later, everyone has to move house. Workers jeopardize their jobs by leaving the office early to make the rounds of rental agencies searching for a new home, yet they need their jobs to pay for the housing. It is a delicate balance. Each new lease negotiation with the landlord forces tenants to fork up or move on. Civil servants and teachers at the low end of the salary scale are pushed farther and farther from their offices and schools. They ride the unreliable buses to work, men in the back, burqa-clad women pile like laundry bags in the few seats reserved for them at the front, and every year the trip grows longer one hour, two hours. It's only a matter of time before these white-collared professionals try to leave their essential jobs in the schools and universities and government ministries and find work at international agencies. 
The internationals pay high salaries, high by Afghan standards anyway, so that an uneducated man driving a car can make more money than a professor at Kabul University or the head of a hospital, the chief of police, or a cabinet minister. Of all the educated men and women competing for menial jobs with international agencies, those who have English and compu computer skills are most in demand. The English-speaking husband of one of my students leaves his administrative job in the Ministry of Education to work for the UN as a driver. A deputy minister becomes a dispatcher. A school principal becomes a translator. Not the work they hope to do in life, the work they train for, but at least they don't have to move again. They can pay the rent. The lucky ones, they float upon the sea of international benevolence, hundreds of millions of dollars of promised foreign aid, while others are swept under. Administered through the UN and USAID, and other assorted governmental and non-governmental organizations, international assistance inflates an artificial economy, parallel to but well removed from the economy of everyday Afghan life. The drug trade is an even more powerful engine pumping up the artificial economy, but it's a homegrown, uh, traditional moneymaker that doesn't pretend to serve the average citizen. Some of the new money finds its way into the pockets of Afghan shopkeepers, tradesmen, and provisioners. A sign on an Afghan-owned grocery store popular with internationals reads, happy all the time. But living in the midst of such plenty, most Afghans are poorer than ever. And that is still the case. Um, all of what I've just read to you was written in 2005. And most of it is still true just more extreme in, in both directions. And then, um, if I may, let me read you, sorry, thank you. Uh, let me read you quickly about um, one last uh, stage here. After the bombing and after the development aid comes security. This is the, the um, last phase. <laughs> no, it's probably not the last, but it's the next phase. And this was written, um, in a, I wrote this on a piece on the internet in summer of 2009. I've come back to the Afghan capital again to find it ruined in a new way, not by bombs this time, but by security. The heart of the city is now hidden behind piles of HESCOs. Giant gray sandbags produced somewhere in Great Britain. They're stacked against the walls of government buildings, UN agencies, embassies, NGO offices, and army camps, of which there are a lot. And they only seem to grow and multiply. A friend called just the other day from a UN building, distressed that the view from her office window was vanishing behind yet another row of HESCOs. Urban life as Kabulis knew it in this once graceful city has been lost to the security needs of strangers. The creation of Heskostan in the middle of Kabul is both an effect of and a cause of war. An effect because it seems to arise in response to devious enemy tactics that are still relatively new to Afghanistan, such as the use of IEDs and suicide bombers. A cause because it is so clearly a projection, an externalization of the fears of men out of their depth. It is a paradox of such force protection, to use the military term, that the more you have, the more you feel you need. What's called security generates fear. So uh, to, to sum up quickly and then buzz through a few pictures. Um, the effect of the bombing was and still is to make countless people destitute and homeless. Even now, some people still living in the ruins freeze to death every winter. And the ongoing conflict creates more internally displaced persons and refugees every day. Refugee camps, uh, IDP camps again encircle the capital. 
Secondly, the effect of development was and still is to enrich a lot of American contractors and political contributors while disillusioning Afghans. Development taken over by military PRTs, provincial reconstruction teams, as most American aid has been, um, throws around bales of cash, literally, fuels local and national corruption and does nothing for ordinary Afghans. And for years, it becomes clearer and clearer, substantial amounts of that aid, estimates range to 30% and above, have gone to pay off the Taliban to calm down. <laughs> uh, and thirdly, the effect of security in Kabul is to destroy normal urban life and encourage once again the sequestration of women and girls. And um, let me show you a little bit of this. Kabul from, these were from 2003 to five, pretty badly damaged city, but this is part of the palace. Uh, look at the buildings. This was a very important uh, residential area in Kabul. You see how people continue to do their business on the ground floor of all these destroyed buildings. Many of these are still there. This is the Ministry of Traffic, which was rebuilt last year, or part of it, anyway. This is one of the most important old neighborhoods of Kabul. Uh, every house destroyed. And here you see Thing, things have just collapsed over the street, and yet life continues in the street, and the little shops continue to operate. This is the traffic of all that international community, the busy streets of Kabul. The women's prison, first thing they built. Um, and this is in 2000, uh, probably 2004, a uh, girls' school going on as you see on the roof or of, a, of a ruined building. Now, progress, Kabul 2010 to 2011, you see um, the city looks pretty much the same, but we have additional electronic equipment on the hillside and a lot more pollution. This is a girls' school in the center of Kabul, still being conducted with a, uh, under a roof provided by UNHCR tarpaulins. Uh, these kids don't go to school. These are the children of internally displaced Pashtun refugees, or uh, internally displaced Pashtuns, pushed out of uh, southern Afghanistan by the American uh, surge there. Um, they're, they're <coughs> fathers and brothers trying to build shelter in these camps, which incidentally are the best organized things in all of Afghanistan. It's a good Afghan refugee camp or IDP camp. The, these people are living in these small ruins covered by tarpaulins, and it's the people in these things that will freeze to death this winter. This has been there since it's still there these, and this is how the average Afghan builds a little teeny shop with rebar sticking up through the top in case he's ever wealthy enough to put a second little storeroom on top of his shop. That's Afghan reconstruction. This is on a major street. This is still looks just like this. Just getting around to digging uh, a, a ditch to carry off the water. What's being built wonderfully is mosques, uh, thanks to uh, donations from Saudi Arabia. These are mostly Wahhabi mosques. Another one downtown. You see m much less traffic and pedestrian traffic in the streets. This is uh, the major market. That's very few people for Afghans who are great shoppers. Those are all presidential candidates on the wall up there. Cars are always on the move. And here's where you see development taking place. This is the library of the Afghan National Army headquarters. 
paid for by your tax dollars, and now they're trying to teach the Afghan National Army officers to read English so they can use the library. This is probably the nicest library in all of Afghanistan. And this is the new National Army Training Center, uh, created largely by the United States, and these are Afghan recruits training for urban warfare. Oh, and this, these are HESCOs, for those of you who don't know HESCOs. Um, I, I haven't taken photographs of the new HESCO stand Kabul, in Kabul because it's too dangerous to, the, to me and to my Afghan friends to try to photograph that stuff and the Pakistani palaces. They're all protected by guards from who knows where, and they're all hotheads. So this is taken on an American forward operating base on the border of Pakistan, Kunar province. And the tent that you see in the background is a standard military barracks tent, so that will give you an idea of how tall these things are. And that you just fill them with gravel and set them up. It, it, you know, the sensible thing for an American to do is buy stock in HESCO. Um, and these are everywhere now in Kabul, and that's what clogs the sidewalk so that people cannot conduct normal life. Um, okay, I'll quit there. Thanks. Um, my, my paper is going to be looking at some of the responses to injury that Jean Howard referred to in her introduction, which are these attempts to resist, respond, and remake. So, what options for political and economic justice do people have when the electoral process has been violated the media sequestered in the hands of power brokers, and official institutions cannot adjudicate in a way that is seen as transparent and legitimate. No, I'm not referring to the US elections in 2000 or to Occupy Wall Street today, but to Mexico's contested election of 2006 in which two million protesters gathered in the Zocalo, Mexico City Central Square, to challenge the election results through acts of civil disobedience. This example, I hope, will shed light on the importance of bodies in politics that can extend to today's protests. I will not go into all the ins and outs of the election and Mexican politics as such or in relation to the upcoming elections. Instead, I focus on the efficacy and limitations of performance as politics using this particular election as a stunning case study of several performances taking place simultaneously in the public sphere. One, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, or AMLO as he was, is called, the mayor of Mexico City and the popular presidential candidate for the PRD, the left of center party, gathered millions in, in the Zócalo when he heard the elections had gone to his opponent Felipe uh, Calderón, candidate of the PAN and the current president of Mexico on the political right. Millions of Mexicans concerned that the PAN might have stolen the elections after seven decades of make-believe democracy demanded a recount. The second performance I'm looking at are the protesters organized by the performance and cabaret artist Jesus Rodriguez who took to the streets and organized a massive sit-in and tent city, or planton, that lasted 50 days and clogged the Zócalo and the main boulevard, Reforma. Protesters enacted nonviolent resistance during which 3,000 
400 performances took place. Got a couple, I think, of images. And the third example I want to go into briefly is that AMLO was sworn in as the legitimate president in a pretend inauguration, pretend that is in relation to the real one that was outperformed as illegitimate. The official swearing in could not be ce celebrated in a public place for fear of public outrage. Rather, it took place at midnight during a three minute ceremony in the midst of a congressional brawl. <laughs> I will look at a few performance elements of these events. The staging, the power, this is in Congress, right, during the swearing in. Um, the power of political performatives and the role of spectatorship that outline the scenario of democratic participation that has yet to come into being in Mexico. How can make-believe actually make belief and shape political realities? These performances, like all performances, of course, need to be understood in situ, within the context of the political acts that gave them rise, the decades of political fraud and corruption, endemic poverty. Half of all Mexicans live in poverty, and 20% live in extreme poverty. The brutal battle of images waged through the media during this spe the specific election, and the traditional marginalized poor bursting in on the electoral process. The show of force by the Mexican military following the elections, and the escalating wave of violence and human rights violations evidenced in parts of Mexico since 2006 that have left over 40,000 people dead. The Sunday following the announcement of the election results, a million people converged in the Zócalo to show their condemnation of dirty politics and their support for AMLO. From that moment onwards, the various protest acts broke new ground. Social um, actors improvised as they went along. The contest for power was clear. On one hand, the PAN was the party in government controlling the resources, the armed forces, the legitimating institutions. It made alliances with the PRI, that had been the party in power for 72 years previously, um, with the media conglomerates, with wealthy industrialists in the north of Mexico, and with the US right. On the other side were millions of people, progressives, intellectuals, young people, and a huge number of indigenous and mestizo people who had finally found a role in a political party. Committed to nonviolent protest, they relied on bodies and performance, marches, cultural events, rallies, amusing and disruptive acts, networking, and other embodied practices to keep their spirits up and carry their cause forward. Who would win and what would winning mean? While AMLO no longer had access to television, he always had enormous power for mobilizing his followers, particularly as mayor of Mexico City. Mexico became a massive training ground for staging scenarios of democracy through civil disobedience. AMLO started the march at the Auditorio Nacional, walking down Reforma to the Zócalo, the seat of executive power, uh, which has been the seat of executive power for the last 700 years, when the Aztec built their coup, or main temple, on the same ground. There he met his followers, who had come from throughout the country to join him. His proposal was that every single ballot be recounted, voto por voto, casilla por casilla. From the conceptual point of view, this performance had political and symbolic force. But the staging posed a real problem. Jesus Rodriguez went to the Zócalo that first Sunday only to find a huge platform structure, an empty stage. During the three hours it took for AMLO to walk from the Auditorio to the Zócalo, the million people waiting there had nothing to do. When AMLO finally did arrive, all his political advisors and followers crowded around him. No one could see him. Jesus remembers thinking, a stage is a stage. It has its rules and norms. Someone has to organize it. People have to be able to see and hear things. 
As she pointed out, many politicians don't understand live teatro politico. So of course she took over. Uh, for the second massive rally in the Socalo, Jesusa had orchestrated the event. The platform now had risers so that AMLO could stand center stage, party members would line up behind him, while AMLO walked from Reforma to the Zócalo, well-known actors and writers read, sang, and entertained the public. Huge TV monitors were installed all the way along the route so that those walking could see what was going on in the Zócalo, and those waiting in the Zócalo could see their leader coming closer. The walk itself took on a sense of dramatic crescendo, symbolically building on and amplifying the effect of AMLO's approach to occupy the center of power. When he arrived, he was greeted with open arms by the admiring patria, the motherland, performed by Regina Orozco. More importantly, the participants could see themselves magnified through the massive screen. They were now visibly a part of a historic movement they could see and identify with. The staging did not, in fact, change what happened. Its efficacy, rather, lay in changing everyone's sense of participation in the event. Performance, the poor person's media in this case, made it possible for people to represent themselves in the democrat, rather represent themselves in the democratic rather than mimetic sense of the word, as in political representation, and to see themselves in and as a political force. By fueling passionate identification, the performative force of the event created the very body it claimed only to represent. Mexican cultural theorist Rosana Reguillo recently noted the move towards the depolitization of politics through the politics of passion that takes place at the margin of political institutions. That is clearly evident in the US today, on the right, and now possibly, maybe hopefully, on the left. The planton was a different kind of performance. This was both a claim to inclusion and the performance of belonging, of establishing a different city that people would occupy and control for 50 days. The tent city, made, enacted, uh, the tent city enacted an alternative version of what communal social life might look like. A political performative to riff off Austin, it sought to bring about the vision it announced, a more open and equitable society. Pre representatives from all over Mexico lived in the makeshift tents installed along several miles of the protest route. Gender roles underwent change as men cooked and cleaned and new forms of collaboration came into being. The planton inverted the private public we've become used to, the use of the public space as if it were private. Cell phone conversations, for example, have created a new etiquette. We take our private lives with us wherever we go. These daily acts affirm the private publics of capitalism with its privatization of public space. Here, however, the private became public as people coexisted peacefully in one of the world's largest cities. A different notion of politics was not only envisioned but performed. The radical utopian character of the planton to recall Herbert Marcuse's words about the 1968 uprisings were expressions of concrete political practice. Living as if culminated in the strangest performance of all, AMLO's swearing in as the Presidente Legitimo, head of a parallel government that boasts about a million constituents. The performative declaration failed on one basic level. This is just an image of a little doll held up in front of the presidential palace and the, um, the balcony that the president speaks from. So it, f it failed on one basic level. He did not have the recognized authority to enact the claim. But it worked on another perform performatic level. 
rather than participate in the simulated democracy of the right, his performance accentuated the theatricality and the make-believe quality of the real. The scenario offered another framework for envisioning a way forward by calling attention to the sham and imagining alternative, alternative plausible futures. The as if and what if, as Aristotle noted, are very serious business. He says the poet's job is not to report what has happened, but what is likely to happen. That is, what is capable of happening according to the rule of probability or necessity. Political as-ifs create desire and a demand for change. They leave a trace that remains an active player in future scenarios, regardless of their immediate outcomes. I asked Jesusa what, from her experience as a cabaret artist, had prepared her for this task of choreographing an entire political movement. Judging from her response, cabaret might indeed be a central training for politics. While she had to keep the general structure of the scenario in mind, that is, the creative, nonviolent struggle against fraud and oppression, she had to function without a script. The improvisational nature of her work in cabaret, where she is constantly pulling topical issues and figures into a loosely structured art piece, had trained her to stay on her feet and respond creatively to what was going on around her. Improvisation as a methodology is practice-based. You can only learn to improvise by improvising. She also stressed the quality of presence developing a deep focus and connection to the people and place around her, allowing herself to become a body of transmission for the energy that circulates in and through her to the crowds. Presence of mind is equally important as she weighs various options. A good imagination and a sense of humor are key, not only to performance and cabaret, but to envisioning a better world. Moreover, running El Habito, an alternative performance space for 15 years with her wife, Liliana Felipe, Jesusa had learned to plan, program events and activities and look ahead six months. While performance is always in the now, it also has an eye to the future. The politics of passion and the scenarios of a more equitable society that these sometimes give rise to can prove politically efficacious. Since 2000, popular marches by ordinary citizens have peacefully toppled five undemocratic governments in Latin America, Ecuador, Bolivia, Venezuela, Argentina, and Peru. But there are dangers and risks to relying so heavily on performance as politics, some of them having to do with the highly unstable nature of performance itself. A couple of months after the contested elections, Many of those who voted for AMLO said that the elections were held again, they would not vote for him. And while AMLO still retains a faithful following, his party, the PRD, has fallen to a distant third in current polls for the upcoming elections in 2012, when the PRI, the government that lasted for 72 years, is expected to return to power. One of the signs out on the streets now is out with the idiots, in with the thieves. <laughs> you have to have a sense of humor, right? <laughs> what happened and why? Well, there are many whys. One thing seems clear. The scenario of a more equitable society backfired. The planton was seen as a strategic disaster, turning off supporters and giving spectators and critics occasion to paint AMLO as a radical. It's fine for the middle class and even progressives to embrace equality on an abstract level, yet um, become afraid when they actually see the power of a dynamic and motivated working class. Political spectatorship is a force to be reckoned with. Spectators are neither the stupefied mass, Brecht maligns, nor the emancipated actors Ranciere envisions. Revolutions and transformations succeed when bystanders join in. The people in the tents 
many of them indigenous and mestizo of mestizo racial origins, triggered a deep-seated fear and racism in viewers. For some participants, the tent city offered a utopian possibility of trust and collaboration. But for onlookers, onlookers the tents, especially as they were pictured through the hostile media, foretold the fall of the middle class that the ads had announced. What if all of a sudden we were all homeless, right? For others, still supportive of the movement, the daily grind of navigating a complex city, further complicated by the planton, proved too much. They would not forgive AMLO for what they came to view so literally as obstructionist politics. Performance is a highly powerful, yet always two-sided sword. It cuts officials down to size, but it's hard to know when resistance and civil disobedience and protest might trigger a violent backlash. The politics of passion, I believe, explain the resurgence and even centrality of the body in politics. As political parties fail to represent their constituencies, people are relearning to represent themselves. The Arab Spring, this is here in Occupy Wall Street, uh, the Arab Spring, the Euro European summer, the Chilean winter, the American fall. But this only works if others join in. As Mexican protesters said, democracy is not about voting once every six years. It's about defending the vote. And one pro protester in Occupy Wall Street put it slightly differently, though I'm going to edit it down a little for you. Um, the sign said, you don't have intercourse every four years and call it a sex life. <laughs> Politics is a process, a daily engagement, a doing and a thing done, which incidentally is also the definition of performance. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to ask Nina Bernstein whether or not focusing upon the American Constitution is the right place to look. Should you just not be looking at international law, crime against humanity, international agreements against torture as the way to bring pressure upon uh, the kind of behaviours you, you discuss, rather than trying to assert it within an American, a US frame as being needing the shoring up of the US Constitution because the US is a signatory to all those conventions from 1948 onwards that relate to torture and cruel and unusual punishment. Is that not a more powerful vehicle for, for asserting the rights that have been abused here than referring to the way um, deportees are, are treated under the US Constitution? Well, I think that uh, there has been clearly an effort, more of an effort to turn to international law, uh, but uh, it's, I don't see it at all as e either or, and certainly the, um, I mean, they, they both, uh, both routes have uh, limitations. Uh, however, I would say that um, one of the important, as I tried to indicate, one of the important issues in these cases was how the Constitution uh, should deal with immigration law. And it's really, that really goes way beyond the issue of mistreatment or, or, or torture or what have you. It really does, uh, uh, you know, and we're clearly seeing, uh, we have, there are 11 million people living in the United States who uh, are, have no legal right, uh, you know, are, are extremely vulnerable to the immigration uh, system. 
to immigration law, to detention. Many of them have U.S. citizen children. And then there are all the other legal residents who are also vulnerable to the, kind of, the kinds of decisions that have, have been made. And I think that is something that has to be dealt with, uh, you know, in the first instance, domestically. Jean. This is a question primarily, but not only for Diana Taylor. I really appreciated the end of your paper about the, the dangers mm -hmm. of performance and politics mixing. I think about that, of course, as we think about Occupy Wall Street right now. And you told about what went wrong. Have you meditated on what could have been different about the use of performance in politics at that moment? Um, can you? You must have thought about this. I'd just like to hear what you concluded. Um, well, a few, a few things went wrong. Um, one was that the intellectuals and the middle class pulled out very soon. They, they couldn't be, they didn't have time. I don't want to say they couldn't be bothered because that makes it sound wrong. But they didn't have, um, they didn't, they didn't, go down to the Sokalo and stay and be active. So the faces that then became associated with the movement were, as I said, the mestizo ones that provoked this uh, very strong racist reaction. I think it would have been very important for the middle class, um, whites, progressives, all of the intellectuals be down there and be a constant presence. So I think it was a, a lack of determination or not the durational performance, if you want to keep it in that terms, that should have been. And I think that is a lesson for us now in Occupy Wall Street. If we look at the photograph that came out in the New York Times yesterday, you can already see what's happening. Right on the front page, a really scruffy guy. And you can say, oh, these are just hippies. These are just people who have nothing, really. They've just got nothing else to do. Right? But if you have enough intellectuals, enough other people, enough people that, is, that are harder to just dismiss, it's going to be dis harder to dismiss the movement. That was one thing I think that happened. Um, but on the good side, if we want to say, I mean, so the spectators are key, right? I mean, it's completely up to us now what's going to happen. And that's the one thing that I think we really have to keep in mind. It's not about those kids down in Occupy. It's all about what we're going to do with it. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing, the good side of this, was that this big uh, staging of political um, civil disobedience was also in Mexico, where there really hasn't been a democracy, a, um, a learning ground. So people were reading Thoreau, uh, and probably much more than in the US, right? Um, Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr. There was a lot of education about what does the Constitution permit, what are the laws, what are the groups doing? And so there was this big training thing where now you have a much, much better educated public about what democracy could mean than what you had going into the elections in 2006. So that's what I say that even when performances don't bring about the desired effect, they do leave traces. And those traces are with us, right? So we remember that a different kind of politics is possible. And that's what sometimes inspires people to keep going. I wonder if I could just, uh, I'm trying to ask a question in relation to both the question and the response. Mm -hmm. Um, which is in, it relates to something I was very struck by Anne saying in terms of the importance of understanding the very different meanings of these histories and these layers of histories in terms of generations mm -hmm. and how extraordinarily different those views are of what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. So in relation to this sort of recent exchange, I'm wondering if in the sort of post-Obama moment of dissolution in terms of the young that we can see now, not only in New York, but Chicago and LA and mm -hmm. cities around the country, if actually they have a very different view of what needs to be done, mm -hmm. and that maybe it's actually not just a case of intellectuals or other people mm -hmm. joining them, but actually listening. Mm -hmm. Um, no, I, I completely agree, and I think it's very important that they're not putting forward demands and that they're bringing together more and more people that are incredibly um, disillusioned and are very upset who have been completely left out. I mean, so there's so many people with so many different kinds of, of um, 
who are you know, disenfranchised for so many different kinds of reasons, to put it that way. I think that nobody should tell them what to do or where to go or how to do it. All I'm saying is be a presence. Mm. Because if we allow those groups to be isolated, they're very easily dismissed. So I'm not saying that we should go down there and have, help them formulate but demands. But be supportive. Yeah. To be, but to be supportive, and I don't mean just simply bringing you know, the granola bars. Um, they say they'd rather have lasagna, if anybody feels like <laughs> cooking. Uh, but, but I'm just saying being a presence and sitting there and being with them and being part of the you know, hundreds and then hundreds of thousands, hopefully, that are making their discontent manifest. So that's what I meant by being present. I don't mean by co-opting a movement. Not at all. I would say on the contrary. We have generationally a different place. And uh, I didn't think of this Occupy Wall Street, right? It was, didn't, it's somebody else's brainchild. Go with it. You know, trust that what they're doing and the momentum that they're building is, and, and they're the ones who are inheriting our bad <laughs> world, right? I mean, so they're the ones who have to find a place. Good, let them be, but support, you know? I know there was a question uh, down here and then afterwards at the back. This is also for Diana, because as you were talking, I was thinking, I hadn't really um, thought what Felipe Calderon did actually was start the war right. against drugs. And as you were talking, I was thinking, was this a response to the planton? Right. Right, of course. And what happened here was what happened right after uh, Bush got elected in these incredibly contested elections, right, was to start a war. And so that's what you do when you want to distract from the fact that you're, uh, the system is so complicated and that there's so much discontent, the best thing to do is to focus things on something else. And so now the violence in Mexico, you know, it's close to now 50,000 people in five years. So. Someone wanted to ask a question at the back. Hi there. Before I ask my question, Ms. Berman, can I be more clear? The the two that were picked up, they both had overstayed their visa? Uh, yes, that's, uh, that's right. The, uh, well, the brothers, yes, that's okay. exactly right. So now I can make my comment, forgive me. Um, my name's Alice Labrie, and I'm former uh, U.S. Department of State Foreign Service. I live in Harlem, and I say that for the preface to my question. But what I would like to say, partly a question and a comment here for all the young people in the room, and I, even to my son, I say to him, please do not do anything illegal. Because once you do that, it's going to be downhill and mother's going to have to come in with lawyers and so forth. So the fact that they had overstayed their visa set them up for you know, being treated that way. So you guys be careful with whatever you do here. Um, so my question was, were there other people subjected to that kind of treatment who were legally here, who were citizens, but were of uh, Middle Eastern or Muslim background? Uh, well, yes, uh, there certainly have been, and there are even uh, today, uh, there are uh, U.S. citizens, they've, there are even U.S. citizens who've been wrongly deported, uh, not to mention, uh, you know, detained. But, I, I really have to point out that uh, there is not, we don't have a system that says the punishment for overstaying your visa is eight months of uh, maximum security detention uh, without uh, recourse. That, that is not the system that, that uh, you know, we kind of, we, we are supposed to have in this country, let alone, let alone uh, physical uh, abuse. Uh, sorry, did you want to add to that or? Oh, I was curious, do yeah. we have a structure? Say we, the royal we, you know. Yeah. Is there a structure that, if you overstay your visa, this is what happens to you? Is that a clearly written law? Or? Um, under the system, the, the purpose of, of uh, detaining anyone in that circumstance would be uh, to deport them. Uh, and one of the, one of the uh, issues here, I mean, let me put it this way. 
Uh, there are many tourists who come to this country, and certainly to New York City. Uh, in theory, it's possible for them all to be detained indefinitely. I don't think that uh, if we were actually doing that, New York City would be the city that it is. So um, I guess one has to one has to sort through these. Uh, you know what you, you, you what you want, Jean. Oh, well, I, <laughs> Help me out here. And I was also I yeah. was also very struck yeah. by what you explain, Nina, in terms of most people thinking yeah. in a sort of common sense way, um, that this was the result of homeland security and yeah. those sorts of acts yeah. that were, were put in place. But what you showed was actually a much longer trajectory and the way yeah. in which another law, in this case immigration law with a much longer history, could be wielded for right. a completely different purpose and the incredible political dangers yeah, um, in that. Yes. Yes, uh, yes, there, there, there really are, uh, and I think we. I well, you know, it's the old, um, the old story that uh, certainly David Cole has said um, that what gets done to non-citizens in this country is becomes the a template for what gets done to citizens, and right. uh, I think we. You know, it's something that we we uh, we all have to consider. But I think I found as a as a reporter that most uh, most people just assume that the the, the familiar uh, law and order uh, due process requirements kick in. That you know, there's uh, right to a lawyer. There are time limits about how long you can be held and so forth. And then something happens like. Uh, you know, one story I did involved the Italian boyfriend of a upper middle class uh, Fairfax, uh, I think it was Fairfax, Virginia girl. Anyway, the outskirts of uh, Washington D.C. and somebody uh, who, when he came in, decided that he was visiting his girlfriend too often and claimed that he had uh, asked for asylum from Italy, and he found himself in a rural Virginia jail you know, just uh, kind of in limbo until literally his girlfriend called the New York Times and a story sort of shamed. I mean, there's a, there's a, a kind of black hole or at least a gray hole here that um, I think uh, most Americans are still not aware of. Um, yes, Maria? Um, before I make my comment or ask my question, I just want to say we throw the term media around as the bad guys always in academia and having Nina and Anne here and uh, really should make us pause before we do that and we really appreciate your work and uh, <laughs> you're not included in that term. <laughs> um, my comment is really about I guess I just want to say what an emotional roller coaster I've been through during this session. And I want to talk about, I'm staring at the title of our conference, Urban Afterlives, and I want to come back to the question of temporality. Of course, we're talking about very, very different cities and very different regimes um, during this session. And it's one of the dangers of doing this kind of conversation that cuts across so many borders and there's just so many differences to talk about. And yet, um, we heard three stories, and the stories had very different narrative arcs. Um, from Nina's narrative arc that, um, you know, results in the two brothers um, coming out of this hopeful and believing in democracy and participating in another movement somewhere else and, um, you know, having hope. And Diana's story about uh, something that starts out looking like it was so huge, a huge movement that's going to have these wonderful results and then, you know, we crash again or we pause and we think. And then this very different temporality that we see in Kabul where it's layers and layers and decades and of occupation and war that continues and that keeps having different twists and you go back every year yourself to observe and write and tell us and leaves us um, 
I mean, at least leaves me feeling really helpless. And I was just wondering if we could come back to some of the questions of the temporality of disaster that Ariella Azulay raised um, yesterday, and you know, just the complete insufficiency of this term afterlife, because. Um, it seems to me that it really doesn't apply and that we have to come to think about time in a very different way. Are there thoughts on the panelists? Um, if I could just respond. Um, uh, we tend to accept the terms of the victors always in all of these encounters. And um, in, the, in the question of wars and disasters as they uh, affect cities, um, it's always the men who uh, are in charge of these things and who get together and make peace, usually excluding uh, women and minorities and other concerned uh, citizens. And they get together and they trade off uh, the spoils, and uh, then they call that peace, and then conflict is at an end, problems are at an end, uh, now the men have peace, but of course for the rest of the citizenry, this all goes on, and um, uh, this expression that I used as the title of my last book, War is Not Over When It's Over, comes from one of the chiefly excluded groups in all of these decision-making processes, and that is women, for whom war and conflict and violence and torture and all of that is never over, but just keeps going. And so I think one part of, uh, uh, of our rethinking process might be to rethink some of those definitions as they affect uh, all of the citizenry and in all of our cities. Um, we shouldn't have to be making up special terms like regime-made disaster. Uh, when, when you look at all these various regime-made disasters, whether made by our own regime or others all around the world, they really are about the continuation of violence imposed by, chiefly by state actors. And they are, sorry to say, those same guys. And uh, something has to be changed. I want to take up that little media thing you brought up. Um, so with all due respect. <laughs> <laughs> And you'll tell us better than uh, I can say, but my, my sense is that most, um, most of the, when I say the media, the people who control the media is what I was referring to. And when, when I get the sense is that newspapers have a slant, whether it's overt or explicit, and that if for whatever reason you don't capture the attention of the media, if that's, I don't think that's, always individuals' uh, faults as, as journalists. I think that the newspaper says, we're going to cover this and we're not going to cover that. This is important and that's not important. And these choices are made all the time. And if you can't get onto the list of what's important, then you've got a really hard, um, a hard row. I think that now one of the reasons that these, quote, revolutionary moments are happening is because we can get away from the media and use the Twitter, and use the Facebook, and use other ways of getting massive attention that doesn't rely on the editor of the New York Times, or the editor of the Wall Street Journal, or the whatever, saying this is an important story and this one isn't. And so, I mean, I have so many fetches on this thing, I'm not going to go into them, but the decisions, it seems to me, are, are clearly made of what's important and what's not important. Anyway, so when I talk about the media, I'm talking about the people who own the media, right? I mean, we don't all it contribute. It just doesn't work that way, Diana. Well, tell me how it works. <laughs> I would love to know. <laughs> I would love to know how it works. I mean, of course there are, you know, clearly there, there are social, economic, political forces that 
uh, influence what is considered important or not important or, you know, I mean, in every institution, including Columbia. But, uh, but you know, the, it's just very messy and contingent. Uh, you know, speaking about the New York Times, a paper is put out every day. And of course now, update, a website updated constantly throughout the day. And you have, uh, you know, literally uh, a front page meeting, for example, if you consider that the front page is the concentration of attention and, you know, though it's, again, it's, it's rather different now because there's also the home page and you have stories that may be prominently displayed there. But, you know, uh, you, you literally have desk heads who are competing to try to get their stories on page one. Uh, you know, you have a meeting where people talk and some decision is made on the basis of what's the mix today and the photos and stuff. It's very messy and I have to say that in a world where uh, clearly uh, opinion journalism, advocacy journalism is much, much more the mode, and certainly in, 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 in Europe this is the mode. Uh, for better or for worse, the New York Times, and, and you know, just not to say that it succeeds, but the New York Times ownership is actually trying to produce journalism that is not taking sides. And actually, of course, it's a, arguably a problem because the New York Times follows the center of gravity of the nation, and the nation, you know, uh, has moved considerably to the right, so that, uh, you know, over time. But that doesn't mean that you can't, as a reporter for the paper, do, you know, do stories that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know that. I, that's you what I'm know. saying. It's not an individual. It's that people. No, but have no. Their... There's nobody. I mean, I, I get the feeling sometimes that you know people think that you know there's some dictate that's you know been issued, and it's just it just isn't like that. And I think and I think yes, Facebook and Twitter has opened uh, the conversation in extraordinary ways. But you know, let's face it. When did uh, things people start, uh, you know, here start really paying attention to Occupy Wall Street. It's when it went, it was on the front page of the New York Times. Right, right. There was a question down here. Uh, here down here. No, down here. Sorry, I, I would just like to follow up a bit because it seems to me that your answer actually supported Diana's comments. And I live in Ireland now mm -hmm. and I am relieved to be in Europe because it is not primarily op-ed and the United States is a very propagandistic place in terms of the media. And I think you can just look at any other similar industrialized country and see a very large difference in the front pages and the stories and how they're covered, even by the most conservative papers in, in different parts of the world. So, so that's one comment. And the second comment is too, I think it depends on how we're talking about the influence of the media. Um, I actually don't think the New York Times hit that news. I think other, other organizations are, have been more powerful for Occupy Wall Street. And, and, and I think that's something that we need to actually start thinking about. Um, and the third aspect too is it seems to me that WikiLeaks seems to be reporting news um, and trying to get at uh, the kind of investigative journalism that people idealize today in the United States. Um, so I think there's a lot of different layers happening and I think that different types of media work differently, but I also think it's very significant to understand the different types of readerships, the different types of interpretive communities. I think educated people all around the world are reading multiple sources. Great. And, and, and all and the more reason that, you know, I don't see why uh, the, it should make such a huge, it should be so hugely important. No, it is. The question remains is why is the U.S. media so fundamentally different but than other... what do you mean the U.S. media? I mean, you, are you putting print the New York media, Times print, and, print and Fox media. News in the same category? I mean, the U.S. media yes. covers a large waterfront. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, no, let's look at just print media. And if we look at the range of US print media on how international stories are covered, there is, in my mind, a fundamental type of difference. And so the question then that I need to understand is, given the messiness of what mm -hmm. you described, which I totally yeah. appreciate, mm -hmm. there, are, there, are, there are differences. And, and, and it would be helpful to understand uh, a bit more about how to talk about this in a way that helps us make more progress in conversation. And then also, if, and I know I'm, I was hoping you would respond to um, how um, nonfiction works also in that. I mean, there, there, there are all of these interesting intersections more today. And so the role of print media, I think, has changed, uh, especially in the last five to 10 years, which is exciting and makes it more messy in the ways that you've described as well. Well, there are lots of other things we could talk about, like the loss of, of uh, foreign bureaus and, you know, adequate coverage and adequate support for reporters to actually go out and get the kind of story that, that Nina is <laughs> em empowered to get by working for a, a great newspaper. Um, and what you get is more and more just localized news around the country where reporters are not supported to do the kind of investigation that's necessary to connect those stories and see what's really going on in a bigger picture. And that's what we used to get from our great newspapers. But so many of them have, have been lost. But I would also like to add um, one footnote on reporting on the military. Um, because that is very monitored, and um, it doesn't appear to be. And most of the people who embed with the military are uh, young men who are really excited about it. And, uh, and it's true when you're out there and people are shooting at you, you kind of like these guys with the guns to be on your side, but they get very much attached and we've I'm sure you're all familiar with the problem of embedding they're saving your lives you're going to glorify what they're doing they all believe in what they're doing and that's the way the story comes out the reporter who embeds and goes out and writes a different kind of story becomes subject to uh, investigation within the Department of Defense. They have people reading all those stories specifically to identify those who are writing stories negative to the military. And those people will not be re-credentialed to go out again. So. When did that happen? I mean, is this really the last 10 years? Yes, it, that's, I think, primarily, yeah. And, uh, well, embedding is, is recent, year. very recent. So, uh, yeah, so this, and, and the Defense Department so carefully vetting who goes and what you can say and who gets cut off the list um, is, is very clear. But it doesn't seem clear to you when you are out with the military because the individuals who take you around and are so nice, and they all believe in what they're doing, and they want you to see all the fine things they're doing, and they don't let you see all the other things that are going on back there, and they don't even let you know that that secret prison exists over there, much less get to visit it. So the military stories then, as we know, are a very, very big part of what's reported on front pages and on whole special sections in, in the Times, the Nation at War section for, mm -hmm. for so long. So um, that certainly colors things in, in print media. I think without a lot of the reporters who are involved in performing for the military, understanding what they are doing, I think they just don't understand it. Sorry, speaking as an old lady, a lot of them are young men and they don't have a clue. There's a question down here on the left. Hi, I want, I want to change the subject a little bit back to, to some of the repression that's going on and to some of the social movements. I just wanted to make three points. One is that um, 
we do need to publicize, and we are all asked to speak in various venues about what is going on in Arab Spring, in uh, Chilean uh, winter, and in uh, the American fall. Uh, and one thing is that I think that we have to uh, talk about um, the lack of a, of a specific program, that none of these movements come forward with a specific program, and the press and the general public ask for those. And I think one thing we have to answer, or at least I answer, is that this is like the early women's movement. What's going on now, does, we want it all. We want democracy. We want to change. We want justice. These are it, it, not about specific programs, although people increasingly specify what they want within those, those demands. And we have to say, this is not a political party that's in formation. This is a movement, and this movement has some very important, it embodies critiques of the present political system. The second thing is that they're shaming rituals. They're shaming the people people in power and they are operating in a way to say we don't want this, this is, we, we don't accept this, there is a politics behind this and it's a, it transcends particular legislative formations and that's something we can do and we're always asked to do and we have to, have to do. Um, the third thing is how do we participate without trying to lead and how to uh, how to uh, take over these movements. And I think one thing is, is you know, to, to enter into them as equals rather than as leaders. We were asked to speak, and we should speak uh, in public, but we also need to uh, simply be there and watch <coughs> and, and uh, take part in these demonstrations. So different, ones of us have different amounts of time, but we all have a little time to go down to uh, Zuccotti uh, Square, to go to uh, Times Square today with the big anti war demonstrations, and so on. And I think that many of us get tired of going on demonstrations. We feel we did that when we were young, and we shouldn't be here. But it's important for our bodies to be here as well as our minds. And, um, and I think uh, there's a nice opportunity for us. Many of us um, couldn't read the newspapers for weeks on end because it was just so depressing from one thing to the other. And I think this has rejuvenated many of us as well. So I kind of want to end with, a, with an upbeat note, but there's a lot we can do and we know how to speak to a larger public through the press, through uh, you know, our writings, but also with our bodies. Would anybody like to respond? Or? Nice yeah, um, we're actually out of time, so I want to thank you. But I also would really like you to please show your appreciation for the panelists. So we reconvene at, at one after lunch. <laughs>